Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, just uh, hope everyone has a nice tea break. Um, I think we're going to quickly go over the uh, next three speakers. So first up, we'll have um, Catherine Laverty talk about uh, persistence and predictors of self-injurious behaviour in autism. Then Gavin Stewart, who's going to talk about sleep problems and mental health difficulties in older adults, um, who endorse elevated autistic traits. And then Helen Taylor, who's going to talk about barriers and facilitators to physical health care described by autistic adults and health professionals. Um, so we will start with um, Catherine. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, you should all be able to hopefully see my screen now. Um, so thanks everyone so much for the opportunity to be involved with this uh, remote research festival. My name is Catherine Laverty um, and I'm a doctoral researcher based at the University of Birmingham. Um, and today I'll be speaking about some of our research that um, I've been involved with that started 10 years ago now actually, um, with the aim of exploring self-injury within autistic people. Um, I'll present to you our findings and what we know about self-injury from this research um, and also propose some ways that we can use this and apply this research to improve outcomes and promote positive change. Um, and just before I begin, um, I will be speaking about some behaviours throughout that might be difficult to hear about, so particularly self-injury. Um, so if anyone would prefer, prefer to skip over some of the slides or grab a cup of tea, please feel free to do this. So to start with, when we talk about um, and use the term self-injurious behaviour, we're really referring to quite specific behaviours. So these are non-accidental behaviours that are initiated by an individual themselves and lead directly to physical damage, such as bruising. And some examples of these behaviours include scratching, skin picking and head banging. And the presence of these behaviours have been associated with higher rates of hospitalisation and exclusion from mainstream services. Um, these behaviours are common in individuals with a learning disability and the research I'll be talking about primarily today involved autistic people who also had a learning disability. And when we look at the prevalence, which just means how common um, self-injury is in autistic people, research doesn't really offer a completely clear picture, so estimates range anywhere between 30 to 70 percent. And we can perhaps put some of these differences down to estimates, um, things like methods used or perhaps the sample from which the research was drawn. So many studies, for example, that look at self-injury often recruit participants from clinical pathways um, where self-injury may be more common. Um, and also individuals may be in receipt of some form of service that could actually influence whether these behaviours are there or not. Um, so recently, researchers within our team, um, with the aim of providing a clearer picture, accumulated all of the current published research within a meta-analysis. So for anybody that isn't familiar, a meta-analysis is a really large scale search of all the papers on a specific topic. And what you can see down the side here, um, if it is my mouse, all the papers that um, were included that looked at this within the literature. Um, and it is a very busy graph, so I do apologise, but importantly, what I've highlighted with the red box there is we can find in this graph the estimate of the prevalence taking all of these papers into account. And the research is suggesting that 42% of autistic people experience these behaviours, so just under half. And we have some um, knowledge about self-injury across the lifespan. So it's really important to consider not just if a behavior is there or not, but how it might change over somebody's life course. Um, so some research demonstrates the persistence of this behavior um, and a recent review actually stated that it was a common and stable behavior. Yet others actually suggest that it's particularly prevalent during periods such as adolescence and adulthood. Um, and some cross-sectional research from a little while ago now um, explored these behaviours in individuals with a learning disability. And actually, um, this research argues against this idea of a stable profile and linear persistence. And it demonstrates a peak in self-injury towards late adolescence with sort of a fragmented decline with age. Um, and one of the issues that is evidenced by all of the research I've just mentioned is that not only the methodologies and the sample used may impact these results, but actually the fact that they typically follow people over a really short time period. And we need longitudinal research to explore the age related change and describe this sort of naturalistic development of self injury, particularly within a non clinical sample. 
So looking further at the development and maintenance of self-injury, typically the behaviour has been understood through a clinically derived associative learning paradigm. And the standard associative learning model within the field is an operant one. So it's an operant behaviour evoked by antecedents and maintained by consequences in the environment. And it suggests that these behaviours are functional. Um, Yet this model really only gets us so far. So we know that everybody, not everybody with a learning disability and not all autistic people show these behaviours. And we need a way of further understanding who would be more likely to develop these behaviours um, and beginning to look specifically at behavioural variables associated with self-injury may be able to tell us something about who is most at risk and what exactly the underlying causes may be. And one variable we've explore, explored quite a lot within our lab is impulsivity. Um, and understanding this sort of as a cognitive model might help us make more sense of the operant model and help us to understand why some people develop these behaviours and why others don't. And so if we think about impulsivity and inhibition sort of comprising of two components. So the first is an inability perhaps to inhibit these prepotent responses in the presence of a stimuli. And the second, is a difficulty to stop this behavior once it starts going. So in the context of self-injury, if this model is correct, we can expect perhaps to see self-injury that is evoked more easily and a behavior that keeps on going and is very difficult for an individual to stop. So holding all of this in mind, um, so far we know that self-injury is prevalent, although our estimates really do vary. We need to understand more about the natural trajectory of this um, behavior over the life course and that perhaps risk is not equally distributed. And it's important that we uncover more about this so that we can understand who is at greatest risk of developing these behaviors. And these points feed into the aims of the current research I'll be speaking about. So the current study was a three wave longitudinal study and it was started back in 2007. Um, and these participants were followed up three years later in 2010 and then 10 years later in 2017. Um, and it was a postal questionnaire that included a broad range of validated questionnaire measures, some of which are along the top there. Um, and we also asked background questionnaires that asked things about service use um, and access over time. Um, and today I'll present our findings on two specific areas. So we'll ask first, is self-injury persistent within this sample? Um, and secondly, can we identify risk markers to distinguish those who are more likely develop, to develop the behaviour? Um, but I will say the paper looked into lots of other ideas too. So if anybody is interested um, in the other things that we also looked at, please do have a look at the paper. Um, so firstly, looking at is self-injury persistent? So at our first follow-up, so this was in 2010, and um, we found that 77% of people who reported the behaviour back in 2007 still reported it three years later. Um, and so the remission column there um, just means the behaviour went away for 23% of our sample. Um, at the 10-year follow-up, we found that for those that reported self-injurious behaviour back in 2007, 44% of them said that the behaviour was still there. Um, and that actually there was a significant decline. So 56% said the behavior had gone away. And actually on the surface, um, this significant decrease does seem positive. However, when we consider that actually for just under half of those that said they showed the behavior back in 2007, this behavior hadn't gone away. It does start to reveal a slightly different picture. And so we looked at this in a little bit more detail. So I'll just run you through this graph. So we split our sample into three groups. So the first column up here, the absent group, just means that this group never reported the behavior. And the persistent group, two columns over, says that the um, individuals reported this behavior at every single time point. And then our column transient in the middle just means that it either went away or developed over our time period, but it wasn't stable. And what we found was that those with persistent self-injury, so this is self-injury that has occurred over 10 years, they did um, have more access with paediatricians and this was a significant finding. However, even though these individuals had experienced self-injury for 10 years, actually our results show they weren't receiving high levels of community service. And this might tell us two things. It might tell us perhaps why this behavior may have been persistent but also where, in fact, we might need more interventions and more information. 
So moving on to our second aim, we then explored the behaviour variables that were associated with self-injury and apologies in advance for what is a very overwhelming table, um, but it brings together 10 years of data. So I'll walk you through it right now. So um, along the side here, um, we can see the variables we looked at with our validated questionnaires that we mentioned earlier. And in the first half of this table, we'll look cross-sectionally. So that's at every single time point, which of these behaviour variables were associated with the presence of self-injury. And we'll do this with um, noughts and crosses. So the table represents effect sizes. Um, and a nought simply means there was no effect and there was no significance. Um, and a cross means we did find an effect. And the more crosses there are, the stronger this effect is. Um, and so what we see is that behaviours that are associated um, with activity, along with autism characteristics, seem to be associated with the presence of self-injury at these points. And we can then look longitudinally. So this is where, as a team, we were really interested in. So what behaviours taken back in 2007 can predict the later presence of self-injury and group our sample into those that perhaps experience the behaviour? And what we see quite drastically here is that impulsivity is the only behaviour variable that predicts self-injury at every single time point and the only one that shows a very strong effect. So in other words, it's the only one with three crosses. And we can begin to think about what we said earlier about the potential cognitive model and how self-injury um, and the inhibition to stop these prepotent behaviours may be an underlying reason for the persistence of this behaviour. So to finish, um, our research shows that self-injury was persistent for 77% of individuals at three years and 44% 10 years later. And we present a stable profile of behavioral characteristics that are associated with self-injury. Um, the identification of these um, behavior variables could be used, as we've said, to shape early intervention attempts and target those specifically that we might consider to be at greater risk. Um, in other words, this would just allow for the right intervention for the right people at the right time, as opposed to devising completely new interventions. Um, and at this point, I just wanted to mention two projects that are currently going on within our lab um, that expand on these ideas that I've mentioned already. So the first is our iRISC project, um, and I'm going to expand the acronym. So the acronym stands for the identification of young children at highest risk for developing severe challenging behaviour. And it aims to pick up on exactly the points that we've raised in this research. So identifying those that may be at highest risk of developing these behaviours and actually targeting interventions based on this level of risk. And colleagues within the lab are also starting a new and exciting project um, looking into the effect of sleep and impulsivity on behaviour. Um, and it's not something that I've touched upon at all in this presentation. And actually, I think Gavin speaking next will cover the pivotal role that sleep has when considering any behaviours. But we hope to move um, away from just parental report measures, which this questionnaire survey was, and sort of get a more rounded and complete picture of self-injury. Um, and to finish, I must end by thanking um, all the parents, caregivers, um, children and families that have taken part in this research. Um, their continued support over the last 10 years um, is what has made this research possible. So we're really, really grateful to them. And also, um, I want to thank my colleagues at the Richards Lab and at the Cerebral Network that have had um, contributions to this project over the years. Thanks very much. OK, that's great. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, so we will, actually we've got two minutes, so I'll just have a quick look at the uh, questions and see if there's any that we could quickly tackle. Um, yeah, so there's a quick question from Laura, um, who's wondering how much research there is currently on interventions um, for self-interest behaviour, if you can fit that in a minute, if not we can do it again at the end. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll probably give a more extensive answer um, at the end if that's all right, but just sure. um, briefly, the, the research that we've done at the moment is kind of on the other aspect, so um, we've looked more about who these interventions can go towards as opposed to what sort of interventions work. Um, I know that with our iRISC um, study, we um, contacted a multidisciplinary team to sort of contribute to what these interventions should look like, um, so we looked at face-to-face -face, um, interventions as opposed to sort of online um, side educational programs and try to combine the best of everything that was available for this for this research 
Okay, sure. I think um, if possible, we'll leave that up on the uh, Q and A list so that we can expand on that later if we've got time. That's great. Thank you so much. And next we have um, Gavin Stewart, who's going to talk about sleep problems and mental health difficulties in older adults who endorse elevated autistic traits. And um, Gavin doesn't have access to a webcam while uh, he's sharing his screen, so you'll just get the slides and not Gavin's face for now. Cool, Gavin, when you're ready. Sorry, I forgot to unmute my screen there. Um, hi everyone, my name's Gavin Stewart and I'm a second year PhD student at King's College London. I work with Francesca Happy and Rebecca Charlton, who is based at Goldsmiths. The broad theme of my PhD explores aging and autism and today I'll be talking to you about one of my projects which explores sleep problems and mental health difficulties in older adults with elevated autistic traits. Um, as a warning before I begin, I will be talking about mental health difficulties in this presentation, so this topic may be upsetting for some. There's growing evidence that autistic individuals experience a broad range of poor outcomes, experiences and functions in the general population. Notably, sleep problems are a common comorbidity in autism. These problems typically present as shorter sleep duration, taking longer to fall asleep, more nighttime waking, and experiencing periods of sleeplessness. Mental health difficulties are also common in autism, with high rates of most conditions being found. Both sleep problems and mental health difficulties are found throughout childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. However, few studies have explored sleep problems and their, and their relationship with mental health in middle and older adulthood, either on the autism spectrum or in relation to autism traits. This lack of old age research is quite surprising when you consider the prevalence rate of autism. Autism has a prevalence of around 1% and this is comparable across the lifespan. So when we consider the population of the UK, which is around 65.5 million people, this 1% prevalence rate means that there could be approximately 655,000 autistic people in the UK. Furthermore, as the UK has an aging population, many of these individuals may be adults or older adults. So despite there possibly being this large number of autistic adults and older adults in the population, research is mostly focused on childhood experiences and outcomes. And there are many reasons for this. One reason is that autistic and non-autistic older adults are often difficult to recruit to research studies. This means that the studies that examine autism in older age tend to be small and the results aren't always generalizable. Furthermore, changes to the diagnostic criteria for autism mean that those diagnosed today look very different to those who were first diagnosed based on Leo Kanner's description of autism in the 1940s. These early diagnostic criteria had poor understanding of the heterogeneity of autism. They were also very male-centric and placed an emphasis on childhood development and intellectual impairment. As a result of these changes to diagnostic criteria, many adults and older adults will be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed with other conditions. However, today the characteristics of autism are conceptualized as a spectrum of traits. So by using this trait-based approach, researchers can examine seldom explored and hard to find populations, such as older adults and females more broadly. So today I'll be presenting to you the findings of a study that explores the profile of sleep behaviors and mental health problems in a sample of older adults who endorse elevated autistic traits. And we use self-report questionnaire responses from the PROTECT cohort to do this. The PROTECT cohort is an online longitudinal study of healthy aging. PROTECT has yearly follow-up requests and there are currently over 30,000 adults who take part. These adults are all over 50 years old and reside in the UK. As this is a healthy aging study, all those with a diagnosis of dementia have been excluded. PROTECT collects a broad range of information from their participants, including self-report questionnaires exploring psychiatric difficulties and other experiences, including sleep. They also collect information on health more broadly, as well as measures of cognitive functioning. To measure artistic traits within our PROTECT sample, we used a bespoke five item screener, which examined both childhood and current socio-communicative difficulties commonly experienced by autistic individuals. We applied a stringent cutoff to this questionnaire with those meeting our elevated artistic trait grouping, endorsing both childhood traits and two or more current traits. 
we validated this questionnaire using a separate sample and found that the cutoff has 82% specificity and 94% sensitivity for identifying those with an autism diagnosis. The measure was also found to be positively correlated with established autistic trait measures such as the AQ10 and the RADS14. When we applied the stringent cutoff to the PROTECT sample who had completed the sleep questionnaire, we found that 1.3% of the PROTECT cohort met criteria for our elevated autistic trait grouping, labelled here as AST. We then created an age and sex match comparison group of those who reported none of these autistic traits, labelled here as CoA. We found that the groups were naturally matched on education history and employment status as well. So with our groupings made, we analyzed differences in sleep experiences and problems using the St. Mary's Hospital Sleep Questionnaire. This questionnaire asks a broad range of questions about participants' sleep over the past 24 hours. Using these questions, we explore differences between our two groups. So for the first question, participants were asked about their evening bedtime and morning wake time. We calculated how long participants slept for at night and we found no differences between the two groups. Both groups slept for around six hours and 40 minutes. We also calculated how long participants napped for during the day and found that the elevated autistic trait group napped for about 28 minutes, which was slightly longer than the comparison group who napped for about 17 minutes. This difference was significant, but had a relatively small effect size. When asked about how deeply they slept um, the night before, both the elevated autistic traits group shown here in burgundy and the comparison group shown here in blue reported similar experiences. As you can see in the graph, most people reported fairly light or fairly deep sleep with similar rates being reported for the other responses too. When asked about the number of times they woke up during the night, both groups reported similar experiences. As you can see in the graph, very few people had an undisturbed night's sleep. While the elevated traits group do seem to have more people waking up three or more times, this difference was not statistically significant. However, when asked about difficulty with sleeping, the elevated traits group reported greater difficulty than the comparison group. Around 50% of the elevated traits group reported some difficulty to extreme difficulty with sleeping, compared to 32% in the comparison group. Of this 50%, around 6% of the elevated traits group reported extreme difficulty compared to less than 1% of the comparison group. This difference was significant and had a moderate effect size. When asked about how they feel when waking, the elevated traits group reported feeling drowsier than the comparison group. About 60% of the elevated traits group reported feeling slightly drowsy to very drowsy when waking compared to only 35% of the comparison group. This difference was significant and had a moderate effect size. When asked about the quality of their sleep, the elevated traits group reported that their sleep quality was poorer than the comparison group. About 50% of the elevated traits group reported that their sleep quality was fairly bad to very bad, compared to only 30% of the comparison group. This difference was significant and had a moderate effect size. And finally, when asked about how satisfied they are with their sleep, the elevated traits group reported lower rates of satisfaction than the comparison group. About 40% of the elevated traits group reported that their sleep quality was moderately unsatisfactory to very unsatisfactory, compared to only 23% of the comparison group. This difference was significant and had a moderate effect size. So the next step in our analysis was to identify those who had experienced severe sleep problems. To do this, we created a composite score of four of the sleep problems measured by the St. Mary's Sleep Questionnaire. We then applied a cutoff at the 90th percentile for the whole PROTECT cohort. Participants who met criteria for this cutoff experienced problems across multiple aspects of sleep. We found that the comparison group had an expected 10% meeting criteria for severe sleep problems. However, those in the elevated autistic trait group were twice as likely to experience severe sleep problems. These differences were significant and to a moderate effect. The final step of our analysis was to examine the effect of severe sleep problems on current depression and anxiety symptoms within our sample. To measure current symptoms of depression, we used the PHQ-9. And to measure current symptoms of anxiety, we used the GAD-7. Both of these questionnaires are widely used 
and they asked the participant, they asked whether the participant has been bothered by a range of problems over the past two weeks. We found a very similar pattern of results for both depression and anxiety analyses. We found a main effect of autistic trait group with the elevated traits group reporting more symptoms of depression, anxiety than the comparison group. These differences were significant and had large effect sizes. We also found a main effect of sleep problem severity. Those with severe sleep problems reported more symptoms of depression, anxiety than those with low problems. These differences were significant and had moderate effect sizes. We also found an interaction between our trait grouping and sleep problem severity. For both groups, those who experienced severe sleep problems reported more symptoms of depression anxiety than those with low sleep problems. However, as those with elevated autistic traits reported higher um, depression anxiety symptoms, this may put them at risk of clinical levels of depression and anxiety symptoms. So before I move on to the conclusion, I just want to highlight a few limitations of the current study. First, Protect is predominantly female and well-educated. However, both groups were matched on gender and education. Protect is also an online study, so older adults who aren't comfortable with using a computer or the internet would not be able to participate. So this may lead to a lack of generalizability. And finally, we used a self-report questionnaire to explore subjective sleep experiences and behaviors. Future studies may want to use more objective measures such as actigraphy, which is a small device that looks like a wristwatch and it can measure physical activity, including different phases of sleep. Using these devices alongside questionnaires may provide richer information about sleep experiences for those with disrupted sleep. So in conclusion for the current study, we found that older adults with elevated autistic traits reported slightly longer daytime napping, more difficulty with sleeping, feeling drowsier when waking, and lower sleep quality and satisfaction. However, no differences were observed between nighttime sleep duration, depth of sleep, and the number of times waking at night. For mental health problems, those with elevated autistic traits reported more symptoms of depression anxiety than the comparison group. When we explored the severity of sleep problems, those with elevated autistic traits experienced more cumulative sleep problems than the comparison group twice as many of the elevated trait group met our criteria for severe sleep problems compared to the comparisons. We also found an interaction between autistic trait group and severity of sleep problems on mental health difficulties. This suggests that older adults with elevated autistic traits who experience severe sleep problems may be at greater risk for poor mental health. However, due to the current design of the study, we cannot disentangle whether sleep problems lead to poor mental health or whether poor mental health leads to more sleep problems. So future studies should explore this relationship. So with these results taken as a whole, they suggest that interventions to address mental health problems may be especially needed for older adults with elevated autistic traits, especially if they experience sleep problems. Finally, future studies should explore whether these results also extend to individuals meeting diagnostic criteria for autism. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Francesca and Rebecca for their support. I'd also like to thank the Protect team at KCL and Exeter for letting me work with the cohort and to the Protect cohort participants themselves. I'd like to thank our funders and importantly, I'd like to thank you for listening. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them either at the end of the panel or in the Q&A box. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Gavin, for that. Really interesting. Um, so we have our last talk of the morning um, coming up in just one minute, and that is from Helen Taylor, who's going to talk about barriers and facilitators to physical health care, as described by autistic adults and health professionals. Um, great. So yeah, Helen, if you want to go ahead. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my video on. Hang on a second. Sure, no worries. Can't find out how to get it. Uh, hang on, let me just stop sharing a second, put my video on, and then try it that way. There we go. There we Great. go, that's better. <laughs> cool. um, okay, is that better? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great, Thanks. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, like I said, I'm Helen Taylor, Dr. Helen Taylor, and I'm a clinical research associate at Newcastle University. 
and I'm going to talk today about barriers and facilitators to physical healthcare as described by autistic people and health professionals. And I should say that I'm a clinical psychologist by background. So, ooh, there we go. So, in terms of the background to the research, I autistic people are generally more likely to be diagnosed with a range of physical health conditions. So this includes things like diabetes and cardiovascular syndrome disease and epilepsy and thyroid issues and lots of other physical health conditions. Um, they also experience premature mortality, which means they're more likely to die at a younger age, and it may well be due to a range of these physical health conditions. And they also experience barriers to effectively accessing health care. So it's one of the areas of research priority that was identified as part of the James Lind Alliance research partnership setting exercise. Um, and today what I'm gonna do is talk you through a program of research um, which is being conducted at the moment about the health of autistic people with the aim to identify what the barriers and facilitators to physical health care are, and also to identify the adjustments needed to promote the accessibility of healthcare provision for both mental and physical health care. So in terms of the overview, um, I'm going to present three different data sets. The first is a systematic review undertaken by David Mason, and this looked at barriers and facilitators to healthcare access as reported by autistic people. And it involved the screening of around 3000 articles, the full text reading of 32, and then the inclusion of six studies in the final uh, systematic review. I'm then going to present data from two national surveys that were undertaken by Dr. Sam Bryce and Dr. David Mason and myself. And these were to explore adjustments to promote accessibility and acceptability of healthcare provision within two separate surveys. So the first survey was looking at physical health of autistic adults and their experience of accessing healthcare. And there was around 400 participants that took part in that survey. The second survey was looking at mental health. So it looked at the experience of anxiety and access to mental health care. And this was undertaken by around 500 participants. So the total number of participants across the two surveys that were unique were 723. I'm lastly going to look at and present some data around focus groups and interviews. And this was also undertaken by David Mason. And this was to explore the experiences of autistic adults and a relative and also health professionals in receiving and providing health care. So firstly, looking at the systematic review findings, this has been written up in a paper by Mason et al, and it's in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. So if anyone's interested in looking further, I've put the reference at the top of the slide. Um, I've put a table from that uh, paper into the slide. I know it's quite a busy one, but I hope it kind of gives you the idea of, of what, what was found. Um, so basically down the side, you can see a number of different barriers um, and the, di the different studies along the top. And really what I wanted to demonstrate was that there was a lot of commonality in terms of the barriers that they were being identified. So the more common barriers, the ones that, that um, were most frequently mentioned are those towards the top of the table, such as communication, sensory sensitivities, uh, challenges in describing pain or other symptoms, and in the healthcare provider's degree of flexibility in their approach. So really the three key issues that came up within this systematic review were that firstly, the interpersonal communication is challenging for autistic people. And that is due to a number of things, including literal thinking. Um, secondly, that healthcare providers may not have sufficient knowledge about autism, and this can lead them to make many assumptions that can't, aren't always that helpful within healthcare provision and also that sensory sensitivities can make accessing healthcare incredibly challenging. So moving on to thinking about the survey papers, uh, these have been, the survey uh, data, sorry, these have been written up in a paper by Bryce et al, uh, which has been submitted to BMJ Open. And what I'm gonna present here is some information about the key adjustments. So these are the things that facilitate people in being able to access healthcare. The first slide I'm gonna show is around physical health, and the second one is around the mental health data. So we, there was a number of uh, 18 different adjustments that were listed within the survey. And what I've done is I've put some examples up here of those, and they fall within three clusters. The first being clinicians' uh, knowledge and communication. The second being the sensory environment. And the third one being the clinical and service context. So just to give you an example of each of those, um, under the clinician's knowledge and communication, we've got the first two adjustments, which are 
clinicians who understand autism and appointments with a familiar clinician. The sensory environment, the examples are locations with low noise level and the locations with small numbers of people. And a couple of examples of the clinical and service context are being able to give information prior to the appointment and providing support in relation to attending appointments. So what I want to try and show with this slide really is that um, the rating scales, so basically we asked people to rate how important they thought each of the adjustments was and also to think about how available they are at the present time in healthcare settings. Um, and the rating scales ranged from one to five, one being not at all important and five being very important. And you can see from this chart that all of the adjustments on here are rated either important or very important. Um, in, uh, on the flip side, in terms of the availability, which ranges from never available being one to five, which is always available, the majority of participants were saying that actually they're generally not that available, um, either never or rarely available. So there's a big mismatch between the things that autistic adults feel are very important to help them to engage in, with their healthcare, but actually they're not available within healthcare. The healthcare services aren't providing these at the present time. And this is the same for uh, the mental health data as well. So a similar kind of pattern um, being shown there within services. So then moving on to the focus groups and the interview findings. So Mace, this is written up in a paper by Mason et al. Um, and it's currently in revision with autism at the moment. So should be coming out shortly. And in terms of the themes that were identified relating to barriers and facilitators, there was um, eight in total three that were specifically brought up within the autistic adults focus groups, two within the health professional interviews, and three that were shared by both groups, which are the ones I'm going to focus on here. Um, so that's healthcare provision, adjustments to healthcare, and autism diagnosis. So just to give you a kind of flavour of the, the kind of um, quotes and conversations that were had within the groups, I've put a few quotes in here. So under healthcare provision, we're talking about the kind of relationship between the and communication between the healthcare provider and the um, autistic adult, and also thinking about their ability to describe symptoms and the experience within the appointment. So one of the autistic participants said, I'm not quite sure what it is they actually want. Have you got a pain? Yes, that's straightforward. Right. Is it a sharp pain or is it an achy pain? What the hell are you on about now? And an example of a quote from a clinician is trying to make it so there is continuity of care, building a relationship with the practitioner so that they don't see someone different every time, which is good practice anyway. So moving on to thinking about adjustments to healthcare. So this is similar to the data I was just presenting from Bryce et al. Um, so thinking about the kind of things that can help improve access. A quote from one of the autistic participants was, I was freaked out about the idea of a general anaesthetic. They showed me the room in advance so I'd know where I'd be. They said other people could be there. And a quote from a clinician, the whole consultation was done standing up. He was holding my ophthalmoscope. I was talking to the ophthalmoscope rather than him because he was more comfortable. You just have to adapt to that really. Then moving on to thinking about the theme of autism diagnosis. So this is the impact that an autism diagnosis might have on the healthcare appointment. And this covered things about it being empowering and perhaps um, feeling less judged as a result, but also some people having more negative experiences and feeling that assumptions were then made about them and their behavior. So one example from the autistic participant is, my head used to be spinning all over the place. I didn't know how to calm down. I didn't know how to this, that. My diagnosis helped me sort my head out, sort my mind out. And a quote from the clinician with this theme was, not just, there's Mr. Smith, he's downright awkward and intransigent, versus, that's Mr. Smith, the reason he needs that care in that way is because. So really what I wanted to move on to, to talking about now is just to think a little bit about the implications. So within these three data sets, we have a wealth of information about the types of barriers and facilitators that there might be to healthcare access for autistic adults. So we, we can see that actually to facilitate better access, we need to do a number of things. We need to make adjustments to clinical settings. We need to be flexible in the delivery of clinical care. We need to ensure there's continuity of care by seeing familiar clinicians um, over a period of time. We need ongoing staff training on autism. 
We need to be gathering information about the individual needs of autistic people so that this information can help advise around the adjustments that they might need. And also we need to recognise the impact of cognitive difficulties that many autistic adults experience and that, the impact of that on their healthcare appointments. So really now research needs to move now from thinking about well, what are the barriers and facilitators to thinking about whether services are offering the adjustments that are needed and also how effective these might be. And obviously with the aim that if we can improve access to healthcare, we may improve health outcomes, reduce morbidity and also reduce early mortality. So moving on to thinking about the current and future research. So there's three studies currently being undertaken within the department, uh, within the research programme. The first is uh, the Improving the Health of Older Autistic People project, which is known as the IHOPE project. And this is a feasibility study of a tailored healthcare adjustments intervention, which aims to try and improve access to physical healthcare. And it's been, it's been undertaken by, with around 24 autistic adults who are aged 50 years and above and they had to have at least two identified physical health needs. And this project's due to be finished in the winter um, and obviously at that stage will be written up. There's also another study which was spoken about yesterday by Dr. Sam Bryce, and that is the Personalised Anxiety Treatment for Autism Study or the PATE study. So this study aims to co-design and evaluate a personal modular psychological intervention for autistic adults with anxiety. And it's a pilot randomised control trial um, to, with around 34 autistic adults um, aiming to look at the impact of that modular intervention that was co-designed with autistic adults. And it's due to finish in the winter and again will be written up um, shortly. And the last one that was currently ongoing, which I'm directly involved with, is the co-design and evaluation of a primary care health check for autistic adults. And this aims to have two components. It aims to have a pre-appointment questionnaire, which will gather information from the autistic adult about themselves and their healthcare, and also about their communication and sensory needs um, to inform um, the appointment. And there's also a health checklist aspect, which is a checklist for clinicians to go through during the health check to um, kind of cover all the areas that are important and relevant to autistic adults. Um, we're just at the stage of finishing off our co-design at the moment with autistic adults and health um, care professionals and we'll be moving on to the randomised control part of the trial um, in early 2021. And we're hoping to recruit up to around 200 autistic adults for that particular um, randomised control trial. So just to finish off, I wanted to say a thank you and acknowledgements to a large number of people who've been involved in all the data that I've presented today. There's a number of chief investigators, Professor Jeremy Parr, Dr. Barry Ingham and Professor Jackie Rogers. The research associates, David Mason, Dr. Samuel Bryce, Colin Wilson and myself. And then a number of people um, who worked within the IAHOPE project and also within PATE and the funders. Um, so obviously we've co I've co covered quite a lot of data today and only been able to give you a very short sort of snapshot of what we found. But if you want any further information, I've put the website for our research group up at the bottom of the slide and also my uh, email address if people wanted to get in touch with me directly uh, and if it's not something I could directly answer I could signpost you to the relevant person. Thank you very much for listening. Fantastic, thank you very much Helen and thank you to all of our speakers today for giving talks that have not only been fascinating but have been exactly on time which uh, is always appreciated. So we're going to have a 15 minute Q&A session with Ellen, Gavin, and Catherine now. Um, so we've all got back. So the first question that's come in is a question from Laura for Catherine about how much research there currently is on interventions, um, which we've asked already about for self-injurious behaviors, but now to give you a proper chance um, to, to address that. Yeah, thanks for letting me have a little bit more time to sort of address it, because one of the really important points I wanted to be able to put across was that there has been um, quite a bit of research looking at interventions for self-injury or um, behaviours that are perceived to challenge. 
Um, but one of the really important things I think that comes with any intervention, but specifically when looking at self-injury, is to make sure that it's an individual intervention and that actually there is definitely not sort of this one size fits all approach. Um, and I think that comes from when I explain the mechanisms of how this behavior is established and developed. So if we can think of it functionally, the first thing I would be interested in um, looking at if a person was showing self-injury was if they were trying to communicate something such as a painful health condition. Um, we know that there are high rates of things like gastrointestinal problems with um, individuals with a learning disability and just ruling out, I guess, any of um, these uh, communications that they're not trying to say they're in pain but then moving on from that if we were able to rule all of that out I would be thinking um, specifically about an individual's person's self-injury and what it's trying to communicate given its function also can we provide um, alternative communication tools that help reduce the behavior or provide different sensory um, environments um, because we know that it's environmentally maintained so um, with regards to interventions my uh, sort of take-home message would be to be considering them very specifically for each individual Great, thanks very much. Um, I'll follow that up with another question for um, you, Catherine, which is from um, Alexandra, um, Alexandra Wald. And the question is, did you look at where the types of um, the self-injuring behaviours that you discussed persi um, that persisted differed from ones that didn't? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. And unfortunately, in the short answer, we did, but not very well, would be my first question. So the way that we looked at self-injurious behaviour was to use a, a questionnaire that um, asked whether the behaviour was present or absent, but then also asked about seven specific types of self-injurious behaviour um, and seven forms that it might occur in. Um, and so we were able to gather data um, within these specific forms. And actually, at the 10-year follow-up, um, the only behaviour that had significantly decreased increased was the form of biting self but I would argue caution from this because um, ultimately the best way to understand forms of self-injurious behavior would be for people to be able to sort of categorize them themselves, which this questionnaire that asked people to sort of tick a box cannot allow us to do. So um, yeah, we did see one reduction in one form of self-injury, but I guess to be more um, confident with that sort of a conclusion, we should have asked the individuals to describe the behavior themselves. Perfect, thanks for that. Um, this question was for Helen, and it, um, it was in relation to the barriers to access to healthcare that you discussed. Um, the question is whether you think some of those barriers could be helped by having autism champions working with each service. Absolutely. I mean, within the health checks study, I think that's very much kind of what we're looking to. So we're going to be working with GP practices in that one. And I think to have an autism champion within each of those services would be really, really helpful. Somebody who can kind of be enthusiastic, take the lead, kind of take responsibility for kind of setting up the services and thinking about the kind of adjustments that are needed. Um, but again, I mean, I come from a mental health background. I've worked in CAMS for sort of 12 years, um, child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and similarly there, you know, I think it's really important to have somebody who's got a level of knowledge, enthusiasm and can kind of drive that home because services are very busy, you know, things do, unfortunately, you know, there's not a lot of time. So people do try their best within things, but actually if you've got somebody whose kind of role and focus it is to try and ensure those are in place, that kind of can help within those kind of environments, I think, to make sure that people can get the kind of adjustments they need to access. And they're not, they're not necessarily big, they're not expensive things to do. They're very low cost. They're very easy, simple things to do. And actually when we've been talking to GPs, um, in the sort of lead up to our randomized control trial for the health check, you know, there's sort of a lot of them are already trying to do some of these things. But if we can put something together in a bit more of a standardized fashion that, you know, and a little bit more comprehensive that all services can kind of build on and take from, I think that would be really, really helpful um, and hopefully a really good experience for autistic adults going forward. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, just going to come in with another question for Helen, actually, from um, Bethany Edwards, who's asked specifically about whether there's any work you're aware of that's being done for autistic adults in a university setting, um, especially given that, that that might mean that they have more than one GP that they need to access at different times. Um, and uh, that is, it's kind of a two-part question. It then follows on to say, are there any difficulties with the student systems in place in surgeries um, for example, drop-in sessions with nurse practitioners rather than GPs. So I guess it's a general question about 
people who are required to access a, a sort of varying um, healthcare settings. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I suppose that did come from the literature is that continuity of care seems to be the most important thing from a healthcare professional perspective, but also from the autistic adults. Um, so I think, you know, if there is a, particularly around university, it's complicated because you do spend part of your time potentially in, in different places. Um, we're actually working with some GP practices um, in terms of the health check trial um, that uh, have university students within them, um, some of the big ones within Newcastle. So um, that'll be something interesting, I guess, to look at and maybe something we could actually build in a little bit of, um, because we're going to do some interviews, so it may be something we could explore with some of those practice groups. Um, I think in terms of the adjustments, I don't know a huge amount about the university system um, in terms of mental health services and things like that. Um, I don't know what kind of adjustments they build in at this point in time, but I think the kind of adjustments that we've come up with here are applicable to all settings. Um, and I think, like I've said before, they're not particularly difficult to, uh, to embed, really, a lot of them. It's just about almost asking and finding out what people need and putting those into place. So that not everybody needs everything, but being aware that there might be some things that would be more beneficial to others. And if we don't ask, we don't know. So I would encourage all services really to have uh, you know, some way of uh, engaging with people around those particular needs, um, be it university or, or physical healthcare. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. Um, the next questions we have for Gavin are ones that Gavin, you have answered already, but I'm gonna ask them again for the purposes of people who are not following along the, the written answers. And, there's two questions, one specifically about whether there's anything in your data about the uh, role of uh, sleep problems being exacerbated by menopause, and then a related question about whether there's anything that you could say in terms of breakdown um, of any effects that were gender specific in the cohort that you have, or indeed in relation to both of those, is there, if there's any additional research that you could comment on. Um, sure, so unfortunately we don't have any data in the current study. Um, about the sort of um, experiences of menopause and sleep problems. Um, menopause is a topic within autism is very sort of under research. So um, there definitely needs to be research conducted in um, the experience of menopause um, for autistic people. Um, in terms of the sort of gender differences within our sample, um, we didn't find any gender differences for um, the sleep problems found, although we did find that um, the, those with elevated autistic traits, um, that we found gender differences with females reporting more symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, it could be due to our sample size being relatively small when we start to sort of chop it up into um, male and female. Um, so that's definitely another area that you know could be researched further in the future about gender differences within sleep problems. Okay, great, thanks very much. Um, going to ask a question to Helen, which is another question from Alexandra. Um, and Alexandra is wondering what, as if you're aware, and um, what source or guidelines should be used for trust-wide autism awareness and autism champions I think um, it's probably worth briefly flagging that our research group under Autistica which Lorcan's also part of did a bit of um, sort of research and publishing around um, guidance for social prescribing in autism which is becoming more common in um, GP services and, and certainly there wasn't a great deal of sort of standardization um, in that um but helen if you're aware of anything um sort of available around um this nationally um that would be great i mean to be honest um in terms of my experience so far we're working quite heavily with the royal college of gps um they they have kind of uh i suppose they have sort of standardized training and toolkits and things and there's sort of an element of guidance in there um, in terms of kind of, you know, how to kind of set things up, how to ensure that you're kind of as inclusive as possible. Um, and just thinking about the kind of their understanding and awareness of those difficulties. I wouldn't say that it's guidance in a sense that it tells you exactly what you should and shouldn't be doing, but it's very much driven by um, the kind of knowledge and experience of autistic adults and from health professionals, just trying to put out what they feel is kind of good practice as opposed to a kind of formalized guideline. Um, but I think generally speaking, 
my my knowledge and my experience is that it's usually through those kind of more professional bodies that uh, this sort of information comes out and that tends to be where people go for advice around how to manage these sorts of um i suppose service related issues thanks and um, the next question is for catherine and it was about whether your study um looked at whether self-injurious behavior was linked to having an additional diagnosis of intellectual disability or whether there's anything that you can comment on about whether there are differences between just people who do and don't have intellectual disabilities on there. Yes, I think it's a really um, great question. Thanks, Sam, for asking it. So, um, because um, this was a three wave study, by the time we reached the third wave um, of recruitment, when we looked at our sample, um, these uh, participants predominantly were autistic people with um, a learning disability. So from our current research alone, we're not able to pull apart, I guess, the differences between those that did and didn't have a learning disability, just because by the time um, we got to the 10 year follow up, um, we didn't have enough representation from autistic people without a learning disability. Um, and I think that not a lot is known about um, what these sorts of behaviours might look like um, in autistic people without a learning disability and actually um, um, a colleague in my lab, Lu Lucy License, um, her PhD is looking at self-harm um, in autistic people without a learning disability and their perspectives and experiences um, with regards to executive functioning um, and emotional processing. And I think that when we understand more about these sorts of behaviours um, in autistic people without a learning disability, we might be able to answer some of these questions and that um, actually qualitative these behaviours are probably different um, and the models that we understand self-injury by um, I anticipate will not help us understand self-harm as it's a different behaviour um, within those without a learning disability. Great thank you. Um, I've got another one for um, Helen which is from John and um, the question is as far as you know is there any research on how autism may affect delayed diagnosis of serious conditions um, resulting in impaired support? Um, the example that's been given is um, cancer in this case, but serious conditions in general. I mean, I don't, I don't have um, sort of named research studies to hand, but I think obviously the ones I, I put up in terms of my um, the beginning of my slide by Crone and that have shown that they are more likely to be diagnosed. And I think certainly my experience um, in running some focus groups recently with some autistic adults um, is that generally speaking, there's a number of things that sort of um, prevent them from necessarily going to healthcare. So they do often delay um, when symptoms might present. So sometimes people aren't sure whether it warrants um, a kind of trip to the GP or whether actually what they're experiencing is kind of normal symptoms. Um, it's quite hard to tease that apart. Um, so they might not actually formally book an appointment, um, which is one of the reasons why a health check might be really useful because actually if you've got almost permission, you're there, you're being asked, is there anything that's on your mind? Um, that's their opportunity, sort of permission to say, actually, well, there is this, but I really don't know if it's something I should bring or not, but I'm bringing it now because you're asking. Um, so I suppose there's, there's, there's sort of that side of things that I think certainly in talking to people, I think generally speaking, we've met some people who just find it so aversive to go into a healthcare clinic um, that they just wouldn't present, even if they had quite um, worrying symptoms. Um, so I, I, like I said, I don't know, I don't know in terms of all the research studies um, but I do know from hearing anecdotal experiences and also from the studies that I did present at the beginning that there definitely is a delay um, and people not necessarily presenting when they should and I can't see how that wouldn't have a potential impact on the outcomes in terms of healthcare conditions, particularly those that do need more immediate um, interventions really. Thank you. Um, we've had another question for Gavin, which again Gavin has answered in the text, but I'm going to ask again for the purposes of people who haven't been following those. And the question was um, whether the dimensional result on sleep quality and autistic traits in, in Gavin's analysis might relate to ASMT polymorphism, so that's an enzyme that you can swab from people's mouth potentially, um, or other effects on melatonin, and whether there's any plans for Gavin to examine genetic or biochemical correlates of sleep. Um, Gavin's answered that that's outside of the scope of his PhD, but I wonder, Gavin, if you wanted to talk about whether that might be something that you think there could be some potential avenues for research for. Um, sure. So there has been some associations found between um, serotonin and autism um, from sort of Swedish national cohorts. And um, PROTECT does have um, some genetic data for their participants. Um, so PROTECT um, sort of stemmed from 
UK Biobank. Um, so they do collect genetic information. Um, so yeah, as Lorcan said, it is sort of beyond the um, the scope of my PhD, but it definitely is something that I'd be interested in exploring in the future. Okay, great. Um, the We've got one minute left. Um, so I was going to ask a question that I think would probably uh, require quite a long answer. So I'm not going to ask that. Um, Very quickly then, Helen, um, Victoria would like to know, um, do you know when it's likely the autism annual health check will be ready to be implemented? What sort of um, timeframes are we looking at? And that ties into a couple of other questions that there were about guidance for um, supporting autistic people within health. Sure. Well, I mean, in terms of the randomised control trial, like I said, uh, we're hoping to start early January. Um, it's going to be the trial itself will run until March 2023. Um, because we're, we're recruiting a large number of people. But interestingly, um, we have, uh, we've got uh, funding from Autistica and we've also more recently got additional funding from NHS England, um, which has allowed it to turn into a slightly bigger or randomised control, uh, randomise control trial. Um, but during that, we're also going to be kind of beginning to think about implementation. Um, so hopefully, I suppose the, the, the message is that we're going to be running some analyses during, um, so we'll be doing harms analysis and checking, but also doing a sort of pilot in the middle as well um, to try and ensure that kind of what we're using is implementable into the NHS um, as quickly as possible. And I think with NHS England on board, um, in terms of their sort of understanding, and, and it's part of the NHS long-term plan, you know, to have a health check for autistic adults with the acknowledgement that they, similarly to those with learning disabilities, do experience difficulties because of their um, challenges in accessing healthcare. So I think, um, I think, like I said, our, our trial will be finished by March 2023 and the write-up obviously will take place then. But um, because we're working alongside partners and talking to and engaging with healthcare practices within the Northeast at this stage, um, but there's lots of avenues and lots of ways of disseminating this quite quickly. If we can show that it's effective, which obviously we need to do first, we can't be sure that the health check, we need to know the health check, A is effective and B doesn't cause any degree of harm. As long as we can ensure those two things um, are true, then we can look at getting implemented and we'll, we'll, we've got access to talk to all the right people to kind of bring that forward as, as quickly as possible. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I think that's a good point for us to draw things to a close. So I just wanted to thank Chris for being an excellent co-chair to all of our speakers in both half of the panel sessions this morning. It's been really interesting research talking about really um, fascinating research and some quite applied solutions appearing in some of those. So a good cause for hope there, but certainly much more to do on that. Um, just as a reminder, there's a recording of this going to be made available on Autistica's YouTube channel after the festival finishes. So if you missed anything or if you want to share it with others, please do find it there. We've shared a link in the chat for anyone who wants to join our Discover Network if you want to take part in research opportunities in the future. And if you found this or any other parts of our festival particularly useful, you might want to consider a donation to support the work that we do at Autistica. So um, thanks once again to our sponsor, Fujitsu, who've made this possible, and to all of you for attending and submitting some fantastic and really interesting questions. Thank you again, everyone.